Okay, welcome. This is a very important lecture on preventing the negative effects of endurance exercise on resistance training adaptations. So it's always easy to fit athletes in a box. You know, over here to the left of the screen, we have Ben Pakulski and a classic more strength athlete. Um, to the right, we have Lance Armstrong, who's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, endurance athlete of all time. And essentially, it's easy to fit them into boxes and in that, well, here's how you train for endurance, here's how you train for strength. <clears throat> but what happens when you take these guys and you make them do cardio, right? Uh, clearly, strength athletes all of a sudden, hey, you guys got to do cardio, right? Um, what's the end outcome of that and why would you do that? Well, one of the one advantages is body composition. So concurrent training is essentially the combination of resistance training performed concurrently with endurance exercise. This is body fat percentage. If you look at resistance training alone from week 0 to 10, we see <clears throat> essentially no change in body fat percentage. But when you do resistance training plus 3 days a week of cardio in the concurrent training group, body fat goes down. So one of the advantages is fat loss. So people are trying to get leaner, they're trying to improve their body composition. Now, with metabolic rate, a lot of times people will say, oh, well, I'm not interested in any muscle, I just want to lose fat, so I'll just do cardio alone. Well, if you lift weights, one of the things is that it raises your metabolic rate. But if you do cardio alone, it actually lowers your metabolic rate. Now, if you do the combination of lifting weights and cardio, then your metabolic rate will actually stay maintained. So the point is, for body composition period, you want a combination of the two and not one or the other. So, <clears throat> another reason people do this is because both attributes are required for many sports. So, for example, a penalty kill <clears throat> in hockey requires endurance, but also hockey players require strength and power. So, basically, they need to train for endurance and strength because it, their sport requires both. One of the questions is, can endurance exercise impair adaptations in strength and power? So, um... Up here to the top, we see strength and power sports. You see these athletes, how uh, built they are, how muscular they are. And then we go down to the endurance athletes, and they have completely different phenotypes. So clearly the adaptations, phenotypically speaking, are clearly different. So can one interfere with the other? Well, we did a study where we basically examine the interference effects of aerobic exercise on resistance exercise adaptations. Here's what we found. <coughs> if you look at lower body muscle growth, what you see here, this is when you strength train alone. That's how much muscle growth you get. But when you add cardio to resistance training, it goes down. <coughs> this is lower body strength when you lift weights alone. When you add cardio to that, it goes down. And the same thing occurs when you actually do uh, look at power. So basically we see that when you add cardio to resistance training, it impairs gains in muscle size, muscle strength, and power. So is all hope lost? Not necessarily. Um, you know, <laughs> it's a pretty funny meme. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, but in order to counter it, we need to know what are the mechanisms that are causing this, quote, interference effect. The first thought came from a study that was performed by Hickson in 1980. And what Hickson did is um, Hickson had three groups, and he was looking at strength gains over 10 weeks. And basically they had a strength training group where they strength trained five days a week or uh, the concurrent group where they strength trained and ran five days a week, and then just an endurance-only group. The endurance-only group made no gains in strength. 
The strength only group made gains all the way to week 10. <clears throat> and the strength plus endurance, which is concurrent, made gains to week 5 and then they plateaued. But what does that look like to you? This looks like the classic stage of exhaustion stage from Hans Selye's model and is a sign of being overreached or overtrained. So, um, essentially, uh, another theory is that you simply have competing adaptations. So, this is a Venn diagram. Look at strength versus endurance adaptations. And if you look at endurance, it's long duration, low force, low power output, whereas strength is short duration, high force, and high power output. Very little overlap. So, we think that the adaptations compete. <coughs> um, <coughs> we can see that here with Hakkinen. You look at strength, strength compared to uh, concurrent training, much better gains in strength with the strength only. If you look at the ability to activate muscle tissue, greater ability to activate muscle tissue with, um, basically with strength compared to strength only, uh, uh, strength plus concurrent. Basically, one of the adaptations we make when we strength train is we learn to recruit larger motor units. This is showing that this interferes with that. Then finally, if we're going to look at rate of force development, this is rate of force development and strength only, and then this is rate of force development when you do concurrent training. So basically, it interferes with the ability to develop force rapidly. So your power gains get nullified. Another interference is that it blunts hypertrophy. Think about it. This is the capillaries and this is the muscle. You want a short diffusion distance between oxygen from the capillaries to the muscle or to the mitochondria. So if you're an endurance athlete, you have low diffusion distance. But if you get large and you hypertrophy, that diffusion distance becomes larger. So what happens is that endurance training blunts muscle growth um, so that you don't have to provide oxygen for as much tissue. And we saw that here in our study. That's gains in, in muscle size resistance only, and that's when you add concurrent training. Finally, is you also get acute interference. If you were to look at strength at baseline, and then in this study they performed uh, 45 minutes of cardio, strength went down to 75% four hours after. It was still down eight, eight hours later and didn't recover until 24 hours after. So basically, if you train this time period, you're not going to be able to lift as heavy weights and your adaptations are going to be lower. So is this what this means? You know, if you do cardio, you're going to lose all your gains. Um, is there no hope? Well, that's not the case. There is hope. But what we got to do is understand the type of cardio, the duration of cardio, the intensity of cardio, how you separate cardio from weights, and other variables. So in terms of the type of cardio, the main ones that have been looked at is running versus cycling. And we did a study basically where we looked at Gains in strength alone, strength gains when you did running plus lifting, and strength gains when you did running plus cycling. Excuse me, that's muscle gains. Same thing happened with strength, running plus lifting, cycling plus lifting, and then the other one was lifting only. So basically, cycling caused less decrements than running. Now why? The biomechanics of cycling is more similar to squats and leg press but also running causes more damage than cycling because cycling is a mainly concentric activity. And then finally, again, mechanically, you have limited hip mobility when you run, but more hip mobility when you cycle, which is more similar to squatting. <clears throat> if we look at the duration of cardio, this is gains in strength, hypertrophy, power, from 20 to 30 minutes of cardio down to 50 to 60 minutes, what we see is a dose response decline in each of these. The, lo the longer you go per day, the greater the decrement. So limit your duration. So we know long duration, moderate intensity cardio, which is the ideal prescription for most people for making endurance gains, actually um, causes declines in power, and it impairs nervous system to recruit fibers. So what's the solution? Possibly sprinting. 
So we see weightlifting and sprinting have much uh, greater overlap. But does sprinting actually help? Well, there's a study by Balabinos, and they took well-trained basketball players, and they had them do weight training and sprints two to four times a week. They're sprinting, they would do 100-meter sprints, 80-meter sprints, 50-meter sprints, 30-meter sprints, two to four times a week. Here's what you notice. The strength group and the strength plus sprinting made the same gains in strength. They made the same gains in power. But the sprinting plus weightlifting made the same gains in VO2 max as the endurance group, whereas the strength group made no gains. This means that you, by doing high volume sprinting or even low volume sprinting, you can increase endurance performance and power and strength. So this is groundbreaking. <clears throat> also, what this is showing is this is looking at mitochondrial adaptations. If you look at um, uh, the, this is four 30 second sprints and this is uh, long duration cardio. Mitochondria before and after long duration cardio for six weeks goes up, but it also goes up with interval training. So the molecular adaptations improve. Now if you go to McNiff, you see that there's a target fat burning zone at 50 to 65 percent of your of your VO2 max or heart rate max. But uh, is that really the ideal fat burning zone? Well studies on this were done on acute exercise, not long term. So we looked at long-term exercise, and we looked at the, the impact of heart rate reserve on changes in fat mass. The higher this is, the more fat you lose. This is the target heart range for fat loss that people put on the treadmill. But we found you're actually losing the most fat at very high intensities. So you get endurance increases and you improve body comp. And this was supported by TRAPS lab. We see high intensity exercise results in greater loss in fat mass than slow steady state in the control. So this is a study we did. This is basically looking at the type of intervals that we've done in our lab. So when we say intervals, we mean you need to go all out, everything you got for that interval. And this is essentially what we do in our lab. So in other words, you have to have nothing left when you do these intervals, and that's how you're getting the fat loss. So we did a hockey city where we had five weeks, four by ten reps at ten to thirty second sprints on the wind gate, which is what I just showed you, or moderate intensity, 45 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity cycling at 65-75% heart rate. So what we basically saw is that, um, if you look at the goal line to blue line, which is here to here, um, Essentially, what we saw is that the, the group that did sprints shaved off more time than the group that did slow. If you look at suicides, which is here to here, here to here, here to here, and here to here. The interval group shaved off more time than traditional. So interval training was better for on-ice performance as compared to the slow steady state. We also saw that the interval gained muscle while the slow steady state lost muscle, which you don't want in a hockey player. As far as energy status, um, in this study what they did was they did <clears throat> cycling, which um, decreased muscle glycogen in, in the muscles, and they looked at protein synthesis. So this group had didn't, re was, didn't replenish their carbohydrate source, and this group did. And when they resisted strain after the cardio, the group that had the higher glycogen source was able to stimulate protein synthesis, whereas the group that didn't was not. So basically what this is saying is that um, 
if you deplete yourself of carbohydrate source and you're carbohydrate adapted, then basically you won't be able to optimally signal growth. So we say is after you do cardio, you should, if you look here, if you do cardio, you deplete glycogen. It takes 24 hours to deplete. So you shouldn't train in this window of time. Legs. And that's what we see in our study. This strength training alone. This is strength training plus doing cardio every other day. Not on the weightlifting days. This is strength training and doing cardio on the same days of weightlifting. So it impairs gains. So practical applications, modality, if possible cycling or any form of sprinting. Keep it short duration, less than 20 minutes. Intensity should be high with intervals lasting 10 to 30 seconds depending on the sport. If you're a hockey player, it probably should be 10 to 30 seconds. A bodybuilder, probably 10 to 30 seconds. A power lifter, probably no more than 10 seconds. Separation, 24 hours minimum to replenish glycogen stores. Thank you is a random picture of Ryan Lowry, who's the world's next greatest scientist. And if you have questions, I'll see you guys in class, and make sure you look at the questions document on Blackboard.